So you wanna set up an Ethereum node, right? Maybe you just acquired a high-powered commercial GPU or an ant miner and want to mine Ethereum. Or maybe you wanna learn Solidity so you can create a Web3 dApp on top of Ethereum. Or perhaps you just want a better understanding of the underlying technology that supports the decentralized ecosystem. Whatever the case may be, I definitely commend you for being willing to get your hands dirty. Crypto is highly technical and hosting a node to support the decentralized internet is not for the faint of heart. But unfortunately, if you miss just a single step, you could wind up spending weeks trying to sync your node only to be dead on arrival when you find your blockchain database is corrupt or you hit some other unforeseen snag. So in this video, I'm going to take you by the hand and guide you past the burning wreckage of where others have failed and lead you to the promised land so you can stand up your node in a matter of minutes. Let's get started. So before diving into it, it's helpful to have an overview explanation of how everything's going to work. So in Ethereum, node is a lot like a server in that it sends and receives data over the internet. And just like a server, it acts as a point of presence on a peer-to-peer -peer network. And the purpose of the node is to validate transactions and essentially support the head of the blockchain, which is continually being appended to. So your node will be downloading and sharing details about newly imported blocks, which in turn supports the entire network. As a result, when you first set up your node, you have to download the head of the blockchain. And there are different syncing methodologies such as fast or light or archive we're going to want to do what's called a snap sync which should be the most performant and fastest to get running now when I set up my node using snap sync what I found was that the entire blockchain was just shy of 500 gigabytes what this means is the machine that you're going to use to set up your node needs to have access to a drive that has at least 500 gigabytes of storage and that storage should have fast read write times the ethereum community claims that a traditional hard disk drive is actually too slow to run a node so you're going to want to use a solid state drive as your storage and for those who don't know a solid state drive looks like this it usually has a smaller profile and essentially contains no moving pieces technically an SD card or a USB thumb drive are also solid state but they typically don't exceed 500 gigabytes so your best bet is going to be either using a virtual or physical solid state drive such as this and super quick unlike ethereum there there is no gas limit on expressing your gratitude, so go ahead and hit that like button so we can evangelize the good word of crypto. Thank you. Okay, so we're in Google Cloud Platform, and we are in the virtual machine section. And what we're gonna do is set up a virtual machine that will serve as our host. This is as easy as going over to create instance. And there will be a number of different flavors of configurations, operating systems, hardware, software. We're going to use Linux Ubuntu and we're gonna beef it up with a sufficient amount of RAM memory and adequate storage. So I'm just gonna call my virtual machine Ethereum node. Region doesn't really matter. We're going to want to make sure that our node has all the resources it needs. So I'm gonna do 16 cores and 64 gigabytes of memory. Now that's pretty expensive, but I'm not gonna leave this instance running. And then we're gonna go down to boot disk. So for operating system, I'm gonna use Ubuntu. And then for storage, remember that we need fast read write times for our storage. So we're gonna select SSD. And we also need at least 500 gigabytes to store the blockchain. So just to give us some margin here, I'm gonna do 1500 gigabytes. And then we're just gonna to go to create instance. And it should take about 20 seconds for our instance to start up. Okay, so it looks like the virtual machine is good to go. I'm gonna click SSH so that we can log in. Okay, so it initially logged me in as a default user based on the account that I've set up on GCP. We wanna elevate ourselves to root. So we do that by doing sudo su dash. I'm also gonna update the packages with apt get update. Update. Okay, and then I'm gonna go to the root directory and just print out all the folders. This looks good. So the next thing we wanna do is download something called Geth, G-E-T-H. Geth is an Ethereum implementation written in Golang. Golang, or Go, is a language that was written at Google. So we're gonna to go to Geth Downloads. There should be an official geth.ethereum.org page. And then we just need to find the build that is compatible with our system. So I'm just gonna scroll down here. I'm gonna select Linux. So we want a fairly recent build that is compatible with 64-bit architectures. So this guy here looks promising. What I'm gonna do is right-click and copy the link address 
If I were to click the link, it would start downloading, but we want to pull it to our virtual machine. So we're going to use wget and then supply the link address and then begin downloading that zip file. Okay, and now we see it here. So now we just need to extract the tar file and we can do that using this command here. So we're going to do tar-xvf and then we'll feed it the package name and that will unpack the zip into a directory. We will then step into the directory. So we're going to change the ownership on the geth file and then we're going to copy geth into user local bin. And now geth should be installed. So we're just going to validate that by running geth version. Okay, and now we can see our version. Okay, so to begin syncing the blockchain, we're going to use this command here. Now let's just step through this command real quick. So any sort of mining needs to be attributed to an Ethereum wallet address. You can generate one a number of different ways using MetaMask, Coinbase. There's also a function here in Geth you can use. So I'm passing my wallet address. I'm also signaling that we want to use HTTP as the data transfer protocol. And then I also am supplying the directory where we want the blockchain to be stored. So there's going to be a root directory called Ethereum chain. Keep this in mind if you are using an external SSD drive, you need to be informing Geth where to store the blockchain. This virtual machine has 1500 gigabytes of native storage, so wherever I put it, I should be good. And then we're just going to reinforce that we're dis disabling IPC. And then there are parameters that could speed up the syncing. One is cache. So we can set the cache higher than the default by using this flag here. And I'm going to tell Geth that it can use up to 30 gigs, around 30 gigs of, of RAM. And then max peers is the number of P2P nodes that you could connect to. And the limit, the default is like 20. Because this is such a high powered virtual machine, we're going to up the default to 150 because we want to connect to as many peers as we can. So first, let's create a directory where we can store the chain data. So I'm going to create Ethereum chain and there it is. And then we're going to run that geth command. So you can see here we're looking for peers and we're starting to sync. But if we want to know where we stand in terms of progress on syncing, when we enable geth it exposes a JavaScript console where we can run some small functions and get some interesting information and do some scripting. So now that it's importing new blocks, receipts, and headers, that means that we are pulling down the blockchain from our peers. So I'm going to open another shell so that we can have a readout of our progress over time. Okay, so we want to attach to the JavaScript console that's exposed over localhost on a special port. We can run geth attach to localhost port 8545. And if you go to the geth documentation, you can see all the functions that you can run. But one is eth.syncing. And if this returns false, it means that we've completed syncing. Otherwise, it gives us diagnostic information about where we stand in the syncing process. And the current block is where we stand with syncing. And then the highest block is the current head of the blockchain. And obviously, this is always being appended to and incrementing. This is something that you could corroborate by looking at etherscan.io. So if we go over to etherscan.io, so let's see here. Latest block, 14009882. 14009875. So we're off by a couple dozen blocks, but that's to be expected. And so if we want to see where we stand in terms of progress, someone wrote a nice little function that we can write in the geth console that will periodically print our progress. And all these commands will be in the description below. And I think it should print out our progress every 10 seconds. So 2% ETA, it's not perfect. I don't know why that's negative, should be positive, but the percentage should be pretty accurate. And the way it works is we're going to download all the blockchain data and then we're going to download all the state data. And you can always stop syncing and resync and it will pick up where the prior syncing left off, as long as you're pointing to the same data dir. So we could sync for a while, stop, and then resume at any point we want. And then as soon as the blockchain is synced, we can start mining. And how long this will take is a function of the bandwidth speed, the CPU, disk read write speeds, and memory. The reason I like to do this on a GCP virtual machine is because the bandwidth pipes are very large and the throughput is quite high. And your read write speeds are going to be high because the drive is 
is high quality. So we're cruising along and this is showing that it wouldn't take that long to completely sync the node and download all that data. And then one other thing that we might want to take a look at is the actual data that's being downloaded. So I'm going to exit out of the JavaScript console and again we can go back to that at any point. But let's go over to our data dir where we're actually storing the chain data. And you can see it creates a directory called geth. It has a, file, a directory called keystore. And in geth we have metadata chain data is where the actual blockchain lives and it lives in a platform called levels database which i believe is just an open source uh, database tool but if we want to know how much data have we actually stored or pulled down so far we can run a command to print that out if we know that the entire blockchain is around 500 gigabytes we can then determine how far along we are. So we're gonna run this command here and we can see how much data we've downloaded. And you can see in geth we have about five gigabytes. Five gigabytes out of shy of 500 is 1%. So it shouldn't take us that long to sync, but it probably will take, I would think about four hours of syncing. So let me show you a few other tools that will prove useful. Uh, there's a Linux package called HTOP, which should be installed um, by default and it will show system utilization. So at the top here, it shows our 16 cores and it shows the load is being evenly distributed. Sometimes you'll see a single core is pinned at 100% and you're gonna to wanna to ensure that you're doing parallel processes when possible. And then memory here, we can see that we're using several gigabytes out of our 64 gigabytes. And then you can see our top processes are the syncing here. So everything looks good here. Um, and then if we want to know how disk uh, write, reading and writing is, is working, there's a package called IOTOP. So I'm going to do install IOTOP. And we're going to run that. Um, and so this shows uh, what programs are reading and writing to disk <clears throat> and the speeds. So we can see here the top program is um, is geth, right? Because geth is downloading the blockchain and it's writing it to our SSD drive. Okay, so when you decide to start syncing, it is going to take several hours. Uh, watching the blockchain sync is a lot like watching paint dry, so please don't feel the need to babysit this process. You want to run it in the background and then multitask while it's syncing. The best way to do that is using a package called tmux. If we were to run the syncing command right here in the SSH terminal, the problem is in an hour or whenever that timeout lapses, the, the SSH session is going to terminate and it's actually going to kill that command and then we're not syncing during all that time. So what we want to do is use tmux to run it in the background so that if we don't have an SSH terminal in place, it's still going to be running on the server. So to install tmux, it's just apt get install tmux. Uh, TMAC, tmux is a lot like screens, it just creates these um, additional screens that you can detach from. Um, so let's do, let's just run tmux. And so we just created a screen, we created a session. And what we're going to do here is um, we're going to run uh, our uh, the syncing script in here and then we're going to detach. And then it will, it'll just be running in the background and we can, we could turn off our computer, it wouldn't matter, it'll keep running. So let's grab that command. Okay, so I'm just gonna modify it real quick. So max peer is 150, uh, cache 30 gigs, data dir is pointing to the right directory, Ethereum chain. So this looks good. I'm gonna go ahead and execute this and we should see the, uh, the typical logs and I'm gonna just hang out for a sec to make sure that it does start uh, syncing properly and then we'll detach and then we should be good to go. It'll just run in the background. So now that this is running, if we were to do control C, it would kill the um, command. We don't wanna do control C. What we wanna do is just detach from the screen. So in order to do that, we're going to use the detach command. Uh, on Mac, the shortcut is control B D. Uh, so you do control B and then you let up on both those keys and then you just uh, click D. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so I just detached from the session. If I want to determine that the session is still up, I just do tmux ls and I can see it right there. If I want to reattach, I just do, get, um, sorry, I just do tmux 
attach and then you pass it the index in this case it's uh, zero we do uh, sorry we do dash t and then you pass the index and now we're back in here uh, so we can always like keep an eye on it um, but I'm going to detach again and um, if I want to just uh, verify from here that um, that it's running properly I can I can use htop um, so htop will show the, uh, the, the, the get commands here only if it's actively syncing. And then of course we can see the CPU utilization that we normally see. Um, so everything looks good here. All right, so we can even attach to the um, JavaScript console here and then you know run our uh, st uh, stat commands here. So eth.syncing. And then I just wanna to prove to you if we kill this, so I'm just gonna exit. Um, so if we kill our SSH window, um, it's still syncing and we can prove that by starting a new session and then just seeing what processes are running. So a couple different ways to determine that we could do, um, yep, so we can see we have our window up, uh, that looks good, htop still showing uh, the mining stuff going on. So. Um, so we can see we, we, we completely left all our terminals and it was still running on the server, which is exactly what we want. And so now we're just gonna wait for the blockchain to completely sync. Okay, so when we're done syncing, a couple things will happen. Um, in the JavaScript console, eth.syncing should return false. And also uh, in the readout for geth, we should start seeing imported new chain segment. Those are kind of the indicators that we're done syncing. Now it's technically always still syncing, right? Because new new blocks are always being added. Um, but we've caught up. We've caught up to the point where we can start mining. So um, if we want to start mining, it's just we just add a flag to the get command because mining is not enabled by default. So I'm gonna grab this command. And throw this in here. So again, so we're adding hyphen hyphen mine hyphen hyphen miner dot threads, and then we're also enabling metrics so that we can see where we are. And I'll do my 30 gigs again, and then let's make sure that we have data dir in here correctly. So it should be Ethereum chain, and then again we have our address because we want to attribute anything to that address, and we're doing everything over HTTP. So let's go ahead and run this guy. So this transaction here, commit new mining work, that's to be expected. Okay, super quick. So because I'm running my node uh, in the cloud, this doesn't really apply. But if you are setting up your node locally on your home uh, network, then keep in mind that the Ethereum uh, mining and syncing process uses non-standard ports. Uh, as part of the protocol to transmit data. So um, what you might find is that when you run those commands, it's blocked by your router. So you're gonna want to uh, open all those non-standard ports uh, within your router settings. So typically that's somewhere under like firewall, uh, IPv4 and IPv6. Um, and you just wanna make sure that uh, those ports are open. Otherwise, uh, those connections won't be able to be established. Okay, and then real quick, I'm in the billing section of GCP right now, and I want you to be mindful that spinning up a high-powered virtual machine and downloading you know, half a terabyte of data uh, will have material costs. So just be um, mindful of uh, the tab that it's running you. You should have credits in GCP, um, but if you're in AWS, it's gonna be a similar deal. If you're doing it locally on your own hardware, then don't worry about it. But um, I don't want a uh, sizable bill to spring up on you, so just keep that in mind. And this is all transparent in the billing section of GCP. As always, if you wanna stay apprised of the latest around emerging tech, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Thank you.